Hi everybody, thanks for coming to Tea and Tales. This is the fifth tea we've had this year, and uh, we're very excited to have two local presenters return to the valley to tell us a little bit about their memories of growing up in the Upper Valley. Um, this, the program this year, the theme has been called In the First Person, and we've been looking through the archives and trying to bring forward stories that people have written in the past about Pemberton and stories about their experiences living in Pemberton. Um, uh, Linda K. Thompson presented last year uh, outside of the Teen Tales program. She's a poet and she has published a book of poems and she came last year to read some of those poems. And that was awesome. That was the first time we've ever had a poetry reading at the museum, so thank you. And she contacted us this year to ask if um, she could come back and I suggested while we're doing this program and uh, being a miller and with roots in the upper valley maybe you guys could talk about uh, some of your memories and, um, and she said well how would I bring my sister Janet so we got two of them I just want to give you a little bit of the background to the Miller family at the uh, William Morgan Miller his house is at the museum. That's the first house you see when you come on site. It's the two-story home. It's a preemption home that was built uh, in 1894. William um, and his brother Robert had rambled through the Pemberton Valley um, and then carried on to the gold rush. They went all the way up to Atlin, I believe, and, and even farther. They happened to meet some Ronins as well. They came back to the valley and sold the lands that they'd acquired here. And Will went back to Scotland. And the Ronan brothers that he met said, you should spend some time with our family. You should look into our, uh, our Ronan family. It would be somewhere to stay. And they also had a widowed sister. So William met Teresa Ronan and uh, they ended up returning to Pemberton. So Teresa had uh, three children from that prior marriage, Vivian, Sandy, and Gerald Ross, and then William and Teresa had um, Morgan and Roney, and followed by Morgan and Roney, then were Robbie and Donald. Donald is the father, of Janet and Linda. So the fellow that built the house at the entrance to the museum is their grandfather. And they did grow up um, up the valley and uh, have returned to Pemberton to tell us some stories. I also wanted to mention that Janet contributed some maps with her mother Elsie um, that are in the history book and we use them in exhibits. They're some of the best maps that we have. They're hand-drawn maps that explain where some of the early trails were through the area and some of the stopping houses. And uh, today Janet's also a writer and um, both the sisters have brought their books and they will be for sale today after the tea. And just a note about Elsie Miller, she was a long-term museum supporter and member, and uh, I personally got to know, spent some time with Elsie, and uh, she was my introduction to the uh, old Pemberton. Um, she had quite the collection of black and white photographs, <coughs> and which are in the collection today. And so we're thrilled that her two daughters are here carrying on the tradition to tell us some stories from the past. Uh, when I came here to read my poetry last year, it's the best venue I've ever been in. Usually there's a, a huge Italian coffee machine gurgling in the back <laughs> and a lot of traffic. This was beautiful here. Um, <clears throat> so we just call this Memories of Home. It's just things that we remembered. We had so much fun when we were kids. I was like the best town my whole life. I don't know, we just played and played and played and nobody checked on you. You just went out and you did whatever it was you had planned to do. Like, well, we planned a lot of forts. 
We were actually made very bad. <laughs> the planning was the best part. And floating down the sloughs in the spring. Oh, yes. We would be looking for water wherever it was. Some kind of raft. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're going to start out with how our parents met. So Elsie Olive Glover was born in April, on April 15th in 1924 in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. And Donald Paul Miller was born December 15, 1919 in Vancouver. <clears throat> Mom was raised in Saskatchewan and had five sisters, Charlotte, Mary, Mabel, and Stella, that's four, sorry, and two brothers, Truman and Elwood, of who were never called that, they were called Bus and Toonie, because <laughs> there was a prize fighter called Toonie somewhere. Mom was the second youngest. And Dad, as you know, grew up in Pemberton with three older Ross siblings, Vivian, Sandy, and Gerald, and his three Miller brothers, Morgan, Roni, and Robbie. And Don, Dad was the youngest. <coughs> Mom was in the Air Force with Ethel Ronan and had made a couple trips to Pemberton. And then she met Ethel's cousin, Don, who was at the GF Strong Hospital in Vancouver because he'd come home from Europe with TB and he spent two years. I thought it was longer. <laughs> recovering at hospitals in Vancouver and Kamloops. <clears throat> so we thought we'd just read a little bit. Janet's going to read a little part in her book that's a beautiful part where dad brings a bucket of water. The father. The father, yes, it's not dad, it's this man in the book. And I will read a short little stanza from my three poems for mother and a little poem called River of Golden Dreams. So this, I'm sure everyone already has read my book. <laughs> and if, you, if you've lost it or don't haven't read it, they're over here in the $5. <laughs> I have all the copies of them in my So in the story, the mother, loosely based on my mother, the time frame's a little different in the family makeup, and some of the relatives pop up, but they're, they're disguised. You know. um, in this scene, the grandmother and the mother are waiting at the house and they've heard that the mother who needs heart surgery has been called by the doctor in Vancouver to, co that, to come right away because she can have the heart surgery. And the father is out somewhere, so they're waiting for him to come back into the house. After they finished the packing, Grandma, Mother, and Julie kept each other company in the living room and waited for Father to come home. Mother lay in the Chesterfield with pillows behind her and a blanket tucked around her. Julie sat quietly at the end of the Chesterfield with her mother's feet on her lap. She put her arms around mother's feet and hugged them tight. The luggage was ready and waiting, stacked up in the living room. Father drove the tractor into the farmyard by the house. He stopped the tractor and climbed off, carefully reached in behind the seat, and lifted a silver bucket down and placed it on the grass. Doggies wandered over and sniffed the bucket. Father patted doggies on the head, then came towards the house carrying the bucket. Grandma had her arms crossed and was watching him through the living room. The grandmother was quite suspicious of everything that went on in the farm. She lived in Vancouver. What do you suppose Duncan has brought home, Sophie? Could be almost anything. Let's see. What's he brought home before, Julie? Yellow violets, trilliums from the forest, and watercress from the creek by the rock slide. She chuckled and had to catch her breath. Once he brought us a whole nest of orphaned baby bears. There's no telling what he's brought today. The front door opened with a bang. Granny, come and take a look at this, he called. Grandma went to the kitchen. She peeked into the bucket. Water. It looks like water, Duncan. Yes, water. Excellent, Granny. But not ordinary water. 
This is the freshest, most oxygen-filled, sweetest water that ever tumbled down a mountainside. Punch Creek water, it is oxygenated, they call it. Now this will make you a cup of tea to end all cups of tea. Well, said Grandma, I never. Sophie, Father looked into the dining room. You two look comfy. We're the very best teacups in the house. He put the kettle in the sink and sloshed water from the bucket into it. Straightening up suddenly, he looked across the room at Grandma. Isn't it kind of early for Julie to be home? He was already moving towards the living room door when, where the packed suitcases were piled. Sophie, he said, and with a few long strides crossed the room. Julie watched with a gloomy face. She stayed at her spot at the end of the Chesterfield and kept hold of Mother's feet on her lap. Father knelt in front of Mother and lay his head on her tummy. So that's um, what I think might have happened. <laughs> Let's see, can we follow our own Oh, instructions. So um, I know that when I was here last year, I did read some of the poems. So you're going to hear them again. Um, this was a little poem I wrote about about um, mom and how she was from somewhere else. But we were from here. <laughs> so it, it made her different, but we weren't different. <laughs> so this is the last stanza of that poem. It's called Home at Last. Mother, come to us. Bring your cardboard suitcase across the plains and foothills, through the Rockies, down the Fraser. Come on the southbound from Lillooet. Come to us here. Leave that dreary, endless wind, the dried up sloughs, yellow grass, the ancient bones. Yes. Come to us, Mom. This is a little poem I wrote thinking about Dad as, as an old man still driving the tractor. And I called it River of Golden Dreams because I think that's the most beautiful name you could ever have for a river and we pass it every time. Once they changed it to Golden Dreams River, but thankfully they put it back. <laughs> River of Golden Dreams. What do you make of the old man as he plows the field, driving the green tractor his father drove 40 years before? When he stops to move the killdeer nest away from the tractor tire, when he goes to the river for a drink, sees the trout in the pool by the log jam, wonders if he can catch a couple and move them up to Owl Lake. This is about our grandparents. We never knew our father's mother, Teresa Roman Ross, from Dungorny, Ireland. Teresa had died in 1937. Her granddaughter, Teresa, yeah, summer school, told us Grandma died when the peonies were in bloom. And our grandfather, William Morgan Miller, born in Salem, Fife, Scotland, died in 1951, right between our births. So as children of the <coughs> youngest children, we ha only had one grandparent, Mom's mom, when we were little. Ella Abigail Gile Glover was her mother's mother. Ella Gile was born in Missouri and came with her family as a little girl to Saskatchewan in 1901. She was a descendant of the Giles who had immigrated as pilgrims from England in the 1600s to Massachusetts. I remember one day we were at our house, our old house, and we almost went into hysterics when we looked out the window and Bob McCormick wheeled his seemed like 40-foot turquoise car into our yard and then we were standing on the windowsills with our toes looking down because it was a high house. He got out and walked around to the other passenger side and he let Grandma out. Um, she hadn't told us she was coming, 
and she had traveled all the way from Abbotsford to North Vancouver that morning to catch a boat <coughs> to Squamish and then a train from Squamish to Pemberton all by herself. There were no phones, there were no texting, there were no computers. She was just trusting that when she got to Pemberton, a good Pembertonian would be there at the station to give her a lift up to Elf. Here's a bit of information about Dad's brother, Roni, Edmund Ronan Miller, the second born Miller boy. At our house, there was always a photo of him on the mantel, and he was very real to us. Roni died in Italy in World War II. He was in the Princess Patricia Light Infantryman. He was buried in the Commonwealth gravesite in Pissarro on the Adriatic Sea. Then do you know how to connect? Pissarro. I saw the Italian thing. Linda went there. He wrote many detailed letters home while he was overseas. And we have them. Roni was the first in his family to have a camera. And many of the photographs that we have today were taken by him. Then he's going to read a poem to Roni in Italy. I, I always heard that Roni was in Italy with uh, Pete Williams. I always wanted to go and talk to Pete Williams, but I was just, I, I didn't do it. I was kind of afraid to. I wished I had. <clears throat> and in his letters, he does mention other people that he meets that what, were from this area. Um, so to Roni in Italy. For Edmund Ronan Miller, born 1915, killed in Italy 1944. That doesn't make him that much older than that. I don't think that's right. Okay. <clears throat> when you go there to the graveyard, it's a beautiful thing to behold. It's so well cared for, and there's Italians farming all around it, and there's swallows just swooping and swooping over the fields. Seventy years now in that warm winter, cockeyed country, in sight of shores wrapped in pale-eyed turquoise. Endless the sapper measured formations, Miles, Miller, Mills, Milton. Far from the cliffs of a gray coast mountain, and the tumbling glint of Johnny Sandy Creek. The photos you took with your box camera are loose in cardboard albums. Blued chevron corners mark black squares on black. Each picture named in your careful script. Mother, sister, leaving by sleigh to visit Uncle Ed. Cousins fishing, Owl Lake, after the grizzly scare. Dad, brother, Brownie, my do new dog, Bob. All the family are gone now. Only Cousin Clifford there on the farm, he would remember you. And the old woman who comes to the cemetery in laced black shoes through the dust of the Italian summer, bringing poppies. Oh, friends and neighbors. There are so many things to talk about when you think about friends and neighbors. And if you're not in here today, you may be tomorrow. <laughs> Everyone in the valley at that time was a cousin or an uncle or an aunt, all the Romans and the Rosses and the Millers. We always had dinner at a different relative every New Year's Eve and Christmas. I just wondered how on earth did you organize something like that to have 20 people come to dinner? Imagine just trying to get the groceries all in one fell swoop, you know? I don't know. <laughs> Janet? I was, we were both remembering family dinners. Aunts, uncles, cousins, second, second cousins, somebody's in-laws, neighbors, friends. And I remember going into Uncle Morgan's house after his service and marveling at how did we fit all those people. There was four of us and five of us and six of us and them and, and his children and their children. And the dining room was so tiny 
and we put all the food on the table and passed it around. It seemed impossible, but we did it, and there were no dishwashers, and everyone used their best dishes and best cutlery. Wonderful. Um, at Molly and Clifford's, they served us ginger ale. It's the first time I had ginger ale. Now, I liked it there. Plus, they made ice cream with strawberries in the summer. One New Year's at Molly's and Clifford's, it was 40 degrees outside when we went out. Linda remembers it differently, but I don't think she was there. Then. And we had a little blue cortina, and I, I think our parents must have just had their fingers crossed. I hope it runs. And it ran, and we got home. But uh, that was the only time, I think that was the lowest temperature ever in Pemberton. Other people can disagree with me if they like. <laughs> or oh, Linda will. Yeah. <laughs> well, I remember it was at Maud and Johnny's, and I thought it was 20 below. <laughs> but I remember we, we were all getting ready to leave, and someone went out and they had a flat tire. So all the men got pretty excited and went out to fix the tire, and they hauled out a tire pump from somewhere. And it was so cold, it just snapped in half. <laughs> uh, one year we were at um, Aunt Gladys's, and Betty Ronan was home from Germany, and she was showing off a new machine that was called a blender. The first we'd ever seen. She told us it was so powerful, you were supposed to throw the whole egg in to get the goodness of the calcium from the shell. <laughs> and Aunt Gladys was in the front hall. There was that huge bookcase with the traveling library. They were all big hardcover and nothing I would have read, but I think the adults must have, must have loved those, those books. I remember Sunday drives and picnics on the on the banks of Birkenhead. Mary, you were probably there. Icy cold water, gravel, rock, beach. But it was fun. We had peanut butter sandwiches and cakes still in the pan. And pink freshie in a big cooler. To get there, Linda and I would lie in the back of the truck on a mattress with pillows and blankets. The little kids up front with the parents. Gates Lake, Anderson Lake, off for a Sunday visit to the Morgans, up a rough road somewhere past Mount Curry. I would never be able to find it again. And nobody would phone me, just drive there and stay for the day. Um, or Birkin and the huge Gimp's house, I, I understand, was it last Tuesday that you did the Gimp? I, I had written this and then I heard that, that, um, uh, it was such a big house, and there was a baby in the playpen who would be older now. And the grandfather's house just behind, I thought that was so cool. It was a grandfather right there. And they had a big meadow with a real stream, so that was a great attraction. And Mrs. Price, once we went by, and she was sunbathing behind her woodshed. And we stopped, and everybody walked around, and there was Mrs. Price. Do, you, do people remember Mrs. Price? The Watkins lady? Was she in the new? Yes, she was. Oh. <laughs> we, have, we have boy cousins with us. <laughs> I mentioned her later as well. And then the railway workers bunk trains on the sidings at Hindu Flats. Maybe they still maybe they were still there. And there was Spetch Creek and I thought, oh hey, we're not the only ones with a creek named after us. And the number 10 Downing Street, Lansdowne Farm. I just remember all these places. And we would go to get apples, where Miss, old Mr. Ward, there was old Mr. Ward and the younger Mr. Ward, said to me, which must have been the fall of 1962, he said, you've got a baby brother, just throw him out the window. Throw him out the window. I was shocked, because we were so happy about this baby. 
Um, just to add to the GIMP story, I remember the, the GIMP kids had the most beautiful playhouse you could ever imagine. It was a real shack with real stuff in it, pedals and knives and forks and everything. So we were going to play house, but we had to divide it up. And Carl was going to go off separately into a shed that had nothing in it. But I loved Carl so much that year that I went with Carl. I gave up the household goods. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, another, uh, more neighbors were Uncle Robbie and Auntie Millie. <clears throat> Uncle Robbie owned a grocery store for a while that I remember most. And he had a slaughterhouse across the ditch. It was always very cold in the summer if you could get in there. Uh, I remember Robbie, he, he, he drove a white VW camper. He always liked the VW camper van so he could go to a party or dance and have a drink and then just go to his camper and sleep it off wherever he was. <laughs> <clears throat> Their house used to be across from Bruce's root house, but Robbie pulled it down the field to where it was later, um, where that big log, log mansion is now. <clears throat> I don't think I ever really saw the house moving down the field, but the image of it burned itself into my head, so I, I used it to write a story where I called the character Bob. and. Um, Bob says, um, the house seemed to glide across the fields, never hung up in the swampy pasture down past the barn, looked as perky as a mallard riding a current. Dick pulled it as far south from the farm as it would go, right until the little red house was nestled at the foot of the rock slide where the old man had planted crests in the spring that bubbled up through the boulders. It was dark there against the mountains, and the winter sun would be late to reach the porch. Not a spot most would have chosen, but Bob liked it. Liked his new view of the mountains to the north. Said the change was as good as a rest. And the kids never complained. One place was the same as the next to them, and the ride down through the fields in the house was the best they'd ever had. I remember Uncle Robbie's store, uh, if he didn't sell all the comic books, he would rip the cover off and then he could read them. That was very cool. Ronan was a cousin of Teresa Ronan Ross Miller, our grandmother. When Teresa died in the summer of 1936, Phyllis came from Ireland to help with the household and the Miller boys. I thought Dad must have been 17, he was 15. The, the dates are a little skewed. Dad said she was always very kind to them, and that the only thing that really annoyed her was when they would go across the river to the waterfall to shower in the summer and always lose the soap. <laughs> I guess it skittered right down the rock face into the river. Phyllis married Henry Erickson, if you can imagine, a Swedish trapper, and moved to a farm beside the Miller farm. Dad always remembered that Phyllis, well, she worked all the time right on the farm and did everything else. She could come in from working in the field and have a whole delicious meal on the table, and he couldn't believe how fast. Her huckleberry pie was something I remembered. It was very skinny and it had sugar on the crust, and we ate it out of petalware dessert napkins with cream. You might say Phyllis was a bit of an eccentric. She had a dog she called, there's a little bit of controversy about what the dog was called, but I said, Victor McCluskey Ligori Erickson. She said she put the McCluskey in there so she'd have something to call a dog when he was bad. <laughs> a Scottish name. Yeah. <laughs> All her cows had same names, and she would, she knew them all. <laughs> Dad knew all his cows, but he didn't give them names. Certainly not saint names. No. 
This is called Trap Line on the Little Wit, 1935. Last week, while checking beaver snares on his trap line, Mr. Henry Erickson was chased up a tree by a grizzly. Mr. Erickson went back later to look at the tree and reported there are no branches for the first 10 feet. When asked to comment, Mrs. Erickson replied, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. <laughs> Shires were our neighbors, too. Verna was my best friend. I loved her so much. <clears throat> we played every day with Fernand Ray. We were always tramping through the bushes with the greatest plans. Ditches were especially attracted to us. <laughs> One day Ray got stuck up a tree and none of us could figure out how to help him down. So what we did was we went back to the house for blankets. We were just going to sleep under the tree and keep him company. <laughs> Verna. This is a little poem to Verna. You were long-legged and short-waisted, had a head of curls you cursed, and a laugh that made the cows in the pasture raise their heads. You knew all the jokes and stories. When the neighborhood boys tied us up and threatened to take us into the bushes, you laughed in their freckled faces. <laughs> Your father made a trip to the city to buy a car and came home with a ticket for driving too slow. <laughs> <laughs> I've written a little bit about the Kearneys. Mrs. Kearney and Mark and Lena came down to visit us when they first arrived in the valley, I thought, two new kids living almost right next door, what a score. <laughs> because it was a long way between kids. We got into lots of trouble. We ate raw turnips for fun. <laughs> I don't know whose field it was. You weren't there then, Jeanette? No, and no. we Somebody's turn. Henry's turn. Henry? Yeah. Could have been Kearney's turn. Well, we stole them. <laughs> <laughs> we looked for places to swim but not drown on the riverbanks. Caught caterpillars. We got a whole bunch and put them in a jar and we hit them in the ditch. Ditches were big. In the ditch. And then we thought, well, what if there's a car accident and somebody goes in the ditch and smashes the jar? <laughs> we took swimming lessons at leeches, which many remember. We got the other kinds of leeches on it when we were in the ditch. <laughs> yeah, we stole, we also got Lena to steal us some cigarettes, um, which we. Went out on a beautiful day. It was a beautiful winter day, and there was a cross, and we could just leap across this little island in Rhine Creek, and we smoked the whole pack right there. <laughs> <laughs> and who did we have with us? We were babysitting our salmon roots. See, you know what I'm rasp, but you're doing. <clears throat> we we drank their homemade ginger beer. And when you pop the top off, there's a big fat raisin on top. I'm not sure he ate it or not. Uh, we did have finished Christmas dinner with them. And there was an almond somewhere hidden in the dinner. Rice pudding. Was it? Yeah, at the end. Yeah, somebody somebody got the almond. Yeah, the lucky almond, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. In the cure was. I remember the first time Kearney's came to Pemberton. <clears throat> It was a dark winter night, and Mr. Yelt brought them to our house. Of course, they couldn't speak any English, and Mr. Yelp did a lot of smiling and laughing. But I'm not sure how much he could speak either at that point. Mom offered to make, get, have them for supper because we were sitting around the table. But they were too shy to eat, but um, Mrs. Kearney did consent that her children could eat, and she let them sit on the back bench, but she insisted that they eat off the same plate. 
So I can still see those sweet little faces eating off their chins were just at the table. And um, I always thought after that that Finnish people shared their plates at supper time. <laughs> We're now up to animals and pets. <laughs> this is called Pooch and Puppy. Our dog Puppy, well he had a real name, but Dad's the only one that called him Tinker. He called him Puppy. Our dog Puppy had a short little tail, and Pooch the horse had a long, luxurious tail. Before he came to live with us, Pooch jumped fences, got loose, wrecked havoc on gardens up the valley. Dad was interested, and we called the sketches. Mom dialed, and Dad talked. Bill told Dad, if you can catch him, you can have him for a sack of spuds in the fall. One evening after supper, we drove up the valley, asked around, found Pooch in a back field at Uncle Sandy's, where he had no business being. Dad had a bucket of oats and a coiled rope over his shoulder. While Pooch trotted happily along, tied to the tailgate of the truck, with a sturdy bowl and knot, I watched him. I was sitting in the back of the truck. He was perfect. Not too tall, friendly, lovely brown eyes. Linda had Shammy, Sadie's daughter. Big, tough beauty with the habit of stopping short and sending her rider over her head where she would nuzzle them affectionately. <laughs> I was afraid of Shammy after she did not. Pooch and I were, with a bit of practice, headed for the circus. The banner would shout, Toby Tyler presents Pooch and Janet. <laughs> Kids nowadays <coughs> don't know who Toby Tyler was. Bob, do you remember Toby Tyler? Oh, no. Clara? No. Oh, it was a wonderful movie about a little boy in the circus. Puppy was advised to, do a, to develop a better trick than shake your paw if he was going to come with us. That's all Puppy could do with she. Pooch had the master trotting in a perfect tight circle, and I was teaching myself to stand on his bare back and my bare feet. It was not for lack of trying, but really none of us did exceptionally well. The circus plan faded. I tried many times to take a run at patient Pooch, grab some mane in my left hand and launch myself upward. I'd fall on the ground on one side of him or the other, or halfway over, like the cowboy's uh, bodies. bodies. <laughs> Pooch still jumped fences with ease. He'd rear up a few times and hop over, a marvel to watch. He didn't do it to run away, just to change fields. My tailbone remembers how many times he bucked me off. Once he kicked his back legs up in the air for no good reason, I flew off and landed on my bottom in the frozen dirt road down by Uncle Robbie's. Pooch galloped home. I walked. Puppy came to meet me, wagging his stubby tail. We also had a horse called Inspector, who we got from Mount Curry. And he was, I don't know what color that horse is. Does anybody know? Sorrel. Sorrel? Sorrel. He was huge, and he had a great big white blaze on his face. One day I was riding him and I, my attention was caught by something else. So I just, you know, flung the reins over the, the, over the fence or the gate and went off to do whatever else I was I found more interesting. Came back and, you know, poor inspector had almost choked to death. And Dad made me tie a bull line over and over and over. And I cried and cried. I can still tie a bull line today, let me tell you. <laughs> this is uh, a bit about mountain trips. Goat Meadows, Tenko. We'd ride our horses and take the cows and cows down the road to Miller Creek and the start of the trail up to Goat Meadows. Once, instead of crossing the Ryan Creek Bridge, the herd scattered across Dill's Field. In those days, there was no fences there, so they were just gone. I was on inspector, and he thundered across the field. We thundered across the field. He stumbled in a hollow, and the whole mammoth, sorrel bulk of him, 
and his four large shod hooves. Well, I just I remember looking up when he went over the top. And then Puppy and I almost fell into the ravine that we, we walked on Talbot's logging road and there was a, a, a narrow part of the creek and the ravine. And Puppy thought he would go down and get a drink, but then he saw how far it was down and he scrambled and I leapt over and pulled him back. And, and so both of us almost went in and Dad was watching and he just shook his hand. <laughs> and um, usually we would ride, but once I was walking and, a, and a, one of the little heifers <laughs> kicked me in the thigh and I was startled. I didn't, I, horses, you have, can't walk behind a horse because it'll kick you, right? I didn't know cows kicked. Well. Mostly we had fun just going up, trying to yodel the way Gus demonstrated for us. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was really good. I don't know where they're going. As soon as they get on the trail, they're up there. You just you don't have to worry about them at all. You just go up after them. And so we'd get sticks and we'd stab them into the spruce tree little blisters of sap that, as you ride along, and, and it would squirt out. <laughs> and you'd end up with this horrible sap all over that was, I mean, we made our fun where we could. At night, we'd sleep in the cabin on spruce tree boughs, listen to the squeak of worms chewing the cabin's log. We'd tether the bossiest mare and let the other horses wander around. Mom's mountain bread made up into spam sandwiches, and then she'd stuff them into a bag and stuff them into the duffel bag, and they were great. <laughs> Thick strips of bacon cooked in the morning, and I was the kid, so I'd have to take the cast iron frying pan with the with the grease in it down to the ice cold creek and clean it with like pebbles, which was like impossible. But you had to get all the grease out, or the bears would like come into the cabin and try to find out. You know. Look out at one o'clock, Dad would tell Mom. I'll be on the horizon. And she would, and he would be there. You can still see the grassy ridge on the mountaintop from the farm. And on Megan's fridge today, there's a picture of Dad and Leah when she was little on the top. And you can't see the farm, but you see all the mountains in, in the back. When I was in grade one, and Linda in two, in September it must have been, before there were any other children in the family. Mom and Dad scooped us up from school and we went up to Tankville. It wasn't the pulley boat across the Willowet or the swinging bridge. Dad rode us over with the packs and then rode back and brought the horses over, I guess one at a time. I don't think you'd want to be rowing a boat with two horses coming and swimming behind. Uh, no, we didn't use life jackets then. Isn't that amazing? The Willowet River. While waiting for Dad to finish all the back and forth, I put some really pretty rocks in his backpack. <laughs> in the front pocket, I was five, and the horse I rode also carried two duffel bags, so I had big cushions on either side of me to lean on. And Dad discovered the rocks when he country packed the pack up seven, seven miles up the mountain. I think he shook his head down too. Uh, um, I did a little research on what we ate as, as um, individuals, what we remembered, and Bruce said, he remembered when we went to Goat Meadows, they ate anything that was in a can. Didn't matter how long it had been in that cabin, they ate it. <laughs> and when Janet talked about um, Dad, he's going, that's all he ever did. It didn't matter if the whole load fell off the wagon or we hit the whole gate with the tractor. If he got really upset, he would take his hat off drop it on the ground, and step on it. <laughs> then you know, whoa, <laughs> that was a bad turn. <clears throat> um, when we were there, of course, there was cows on the farm. I started thinking a lot about cows, and I wrote this story, or poem, I guess. It's in a few parts, and I'll read the title. This is called Cows in the Family, Back Story. Who paid attention on the farm? We had cows, they were in the field. I knew, to, I knew a cow had a long straight back. A width and level 
on which you could rest the book, but a farmer would never say it like that. What I knew about cows could have fit in a shot glass at the show. In the movies, I noticed cows, scrawny and dull, plodding west, screen after screen of dusty ground, bones and horns festooning every water hole. There was likely an old milker tied to the tailgate of Conestoga. If Ada makes it to the end of the trail, she will kneel down beside her settler and kiss the golden grass of Oregon. In the cattle baron movies, cattle that studded the green valleys and hillsides so slick and happy they must have purred like kittens. Great granddaddy Truman Gow. In the blizzard of 1906, Truman lost seven of his herd to the deep drifts. None were found, though the neighbors searched as far north as Wood Mountain. Then, late in April, like a bovine miracle, one of the two-year-olds was spotted on Willow Bluff Trail, south of Bilden, making his way in the direction of NW 101326. <clears throat> Home farm. In the 70s, my sister, rises an hour before school, goes out to mix milk in a bucket for bocker and fudge. At their meetings in the church basement, the 4-H'ers pledge their hearts and hands to the study of animal husbandry, production, and marketing. Late in the fall, this is how they do it, she sells the two fattened calves back to death, and she never wants to know what happened after that. <laughs> They love him in their way. Have you heard a farmer call the cows? It's a low tone, a slow sing-song. Cowboys, cowboys. Those two notes roll like a fat alfalfa bale. Across the fields and back by the river, they raise their white faces, head straight to the farmer and the sound. Dreams. At night, I dream about the old farm. All the fields are flooded, water lapping at the front steps, and the cows are gone. I try to find them, but my limbs are like wet silage. Intergenerational bad luck. Cows don't do well in floods. They'll likely panic and lose their sense. In the fall of 1940, our grandfather, Jock Miller, lost several fine heifers from the Lillooet and Ryan reached their banks. He wrote to Nell, <clears throat> the horses kept their heads and found high ground, but mercy, the cows, they ran in circles, plunging into holes and barbed wire fences. Nine are gone. Sunday picnic. Gilmore's, five miles south, had dairy cows, lumbering black and white giants, faces long and sad as lifers, hauling their bags back to the barn every morning and night. We'd rattle past on a Sunday evening, all of us packed in the cab of the Chevy, singing about love knots in our lariats and Rose's cantina, while the windows of the Gilmore's barn glowed yellow, like a long cow hotel still doing business into the night. What we ate. Does anybody remember anything but meat and potatoes at every single meal? Maybe not breakfast. My mom remembered when she came to Pemberton, Mr. Miller would put the porridge on at night and they would eat that in the morning. When I asked Ida and Bobby about it, Ida told me that Bobby gagged on the porridge, she couldn't eat it. <laughs> mom invented a couple recipes marshmallow cookies, pistachio nut pudding. I don't think she invented coconut clusters, but we ate a lot of them. Mom loved sugar, and I don't remember her ever saying, don't oh, use too much sugar in your porridge. <laughs> Every bowl I ate was a deep brown color. <laughs> we even soaked bread in milk and put sugar on that and ate that. Mm -hmm. Well, that was good. We both wondered about the root beer at the old house, I remember root beer. Dad and Mom made it, and then they hid it. I don't know where it was, really. Sometimes maybe you could hear the explosions. 
Um, oh, and, and we didn't have pot except the ginger ale at Claire's house. So I put a bit of baking soda in freshy and it would fizz and I'd pretend it was hot. <laughs> a couple things mom never cooked because dad hated them and I think it was because when he was in the army. He hated peppers, he hated celery, he hated cooked cheese and he hated tomatoes cooked. So we never had those. Dad would often finish up a meal with a peanut butter sandwich. He didn't think that was good. <laughs> he and I would stay at the dinner table really late eating ice, vanilla ice cream. After rain, we'd hunt for mushrooms and fry them up with butter and lots of salt. Oh, what we did for fun? Oh, we had, we didn't have a lot of toys. We didn't even have a bike, never. You know, the kids who got the bikes were Janica or Selma and Bruce. They got new bikes. The bike we had came from Phyllis Erickson. She came walking up the road one day with a giant black bike that she had brought from Ireland. And she said, I don't think I'll be needing this anymore. And she gave it to us. It was, <clears throat> it was really big. You could not sit on the seat. And we painted it with the only paint we had, which was pea green. <laughs> Mom asked, how can we repay you, Phyllis, for the bike? And Phyllis said, you can repay me with good deeds. And I thought, after she was gone, I said, what is that, Mom? What is a good deed? <laughs> I, I, never, I never learned to ride that bike. I remember taking it into the field, the bumpy field, cow pies everywhere, and falling off it, and falling off it, and I just thought, I'm just going to do horses, I'm not going to do bikes. <laughs> so here's, here's a little story. The Victoria Day weekend. On the Saturday of the May long weekend, Linda and I would ride our horses from the farm all the way to the Mount Curry Rio. Mum would have bought us brand new, unwashed blue jeans at Mr. Pipes for the occasion. We'd get, on our, get our horses ready and wait for Margaret to come riding along. I don't remember Margaret's horse's name. We'd pick up Ella and High Life, her horse, at their place, and a bunch of boys would appear out of nowhere, it seemed to me as I was the youngest, <laughs> and joined us as we rode along. At Taylor's Corner, we'd veer off and follow the dike under the railway bridge and come out to the main road somewhere, searchers maybe, or maybe we went all the way along the dike to the Lower River Highway Bridge, it depended if there was fences. Twelve miles of clip-clop and trotting for the hard, unforgiving scenes of the new blue jeans to rub raw patches on the skin of my legs. At the rodeo, I'd sit around in the shade on my horse with other kids who were sitting around in the shade on their horses. I'd give rides to kids who asked, get money from mom, eat hot dogs, drink coke, have a blast. Once I borrowed a fast horse and entered a race, by the halfway point of the huge round track, my goal for the race had been downgraded to <laughs> do not fall off. <laughs> we drive home with the family at the end of the day. Dad made arrangements for the horses to board somewhere for the night. I didn't give it a thought. On the Monday, we would ride all the way home. What an awesome weekend. <laughs> Music, piano lessons, and talent shows. Mom was a strict disciplinarian when it came to practicing the piano. I hated to practice, and she made me do it by the sheer force of her Saskatchewan will. A couple of years ago, I came across a notebook of Mrs. Schantz, a piano teacher, and she said on in May 10th, I think it was, 1960, she writes, <clears throat> Alma Lundgren and Linda Miller both came this week for their first piano lesson. Alma shows real talent. <laughs> <laughs> the community hall used to host traveling bands. Oh, God. Evan Camp and Tola Roche. And they had a, 
wife and a singer, and I don't remember her name, but I loved her. After we came home from these nights, I'd play the piano for hours, uh, dreaming about how I was going to be a movie star and a singer, and playing things like dance with the girl with the hole in your stocking, <laughs> or sweet Betsy Rum Pike, which was a favorite. Who crossed the wide prairie with her lover Ike With two yoke of cattle and an old spotted hog Two Shanghai roosters and an old yeller dog They soon reached the desert where Betsy gave out Down on the sand she lay rolling about I can't remember what Ike says to her Except you're going to get up <laughs> You're going to get sand in your eyes, Betsy <laughs> I don't know if anyone has ever risen to stardom on the basis of their rendition of Sweet Betsy Jane. <laughs> <laughs> the Shantzes, I was more, and the Shantzes, the, the house of our grandfathers was the Shantzes house where we went for, for uh, piano lessons. Um, I was more interested in the huge heavy art books that they had and the amazing paintings in them. And the honor, I was waiting for Linda's half hour lesson to finish. We could go into their little teeny kitchen and make a hot chocolate and take a cookie or two out of the real cookie jar with a lid to hit or ten. Well, no, because we had to leave some. And she always had a slice of apple to keep them moist. I remember at home, Mom made like crisp cookies and there was no point in putting them in a cookie jar. They just were gone. Each week, I, I worried whether Mrs. Schantz would be able to tell that I hadn't really practiced. <laughs> the piano uh, recitals were really exciting because you'd dress up and all the parents and kids would crowd. I, I remember one at, in Taylor's living room, the old Taylor house on the corner. Does anybody live there now? It doesn't look like it. But you know, you ram maybe 60 people in there, and, and then there's just a little kid. <laughs> Mom always signed us up for talent shows that were at the, at the community hall. She didn't worry about my lack of talent. <laughs> I, I think it was good training. She just thought it would be good, be good for the girls to get up on stage and do something. <laughs> English Country Garden played on an old piano on the stage with all the correct fingering, hitting the right keys one at a time, me counting one, two, like Mrs. Schultz, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. A step up from Papa Hayden's Dead and Gone, which I played the year before, but that's just one hand. <laughs> the audience was very kind. And when we were young teenagers, and with apologies to Marty Robbins, Lena and I sang The Little Old Green Valley Far Away on that stage. We had practiced with Mum giving us a starting note on the piano and then chording through the song, and we did okay. On the night of the show, someone decided that we would be accompanied by Maury Yelp on the guitar and there was no note to start us off, and no mum. It was a complete disaster. <laughs> okay. If Janet and I ever boarded the same bus that Bob Matthews was driving, he always called out very loudly, Good morning, Blondie. Good morning, <laughs> little Blondie. <laughs> oh, we hated that. I, got, I went to school at the Quonset Hut in grade two, but after that, we all went up the valley. Once in grade two, Jack Guthrie was driving that, and we had the funny little round school bus with seats, just a bench seat down the side, one at the back. And we went right in the ditch by Lex Ross's. And I remember Mr. Guthrie getting up, putting his hat on, and the big boys climbed up the back and opened the emergency door. And uh, he had to climb up hill to get to it. I looked down. Bob Miller says, jump, Linda, jump! <laughs> I guess I jumped. We had Mrs. Piggott, Mrs. Olson, Mrs. Ashdown, Mr. Morsh, Mr. Langford. Mrs. Bentham, Miss Berger. The Pemberton Meadow Mice were powerful sports day competitors <clears throat> against the Signal Hill town kids. Right, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> we had a little bad. Miss Berger got hold of a hand-powered sewing machine 
and set it up in the staff room. And Len and I sewed all kinds of things. So one of us would stand and turn it, and the other one would sew. And you'd say, slower, slow, faster, faster, <laughs> slower, slower. I don't know how, I guess you didn't go back. <laughs> one year we had a visit in October by the superintendent of schools. And he told us that there weren't enough students to warrant two classrooms and two teachers. So one teacher was laid off. And we all bundled into the classroom with the view of the road. W.A.C. Bennett, the B.C. Premier, visited the school, the Upper Valley School. I remember there was a rule at school that girls had to wear skirts or dresses. And after some members of the board visited the school and saw all us girls running around somersaulting, cartwheeling, swinging like maniacs, they changed the rules and let us wear pants. <laughs> Here's a little story called Picking Sticks and Other Pursuits of My Upper Valley Childhood. On a blazing hot afternoon in the summer of 1964 or thereabouts, I wear a hat, t-shirt, jeans, and my new pink runners, as I don't know where I put my old ones, and it's too hot for my rubber boots. Sweaty, dusty, thirsty, and rather grumpy, I stumble along beside the wagon wrecking my beautiful new shoes in the soft brown soil of the recently worked field. We'll wash them, Mom says. They'll be fine. Then pick up a stick, pick up another and another until I have an armful. Pack the lot over to the wagon and dump them. The wood scratches my arms. The dust rises and I breathe it in. My eyes are dry and scratchy. I'm a young teenager and I'm not happy to be here in this field with my family. We are picking sticks. The sticks remind us that a scant half century ago, this was not a field but a forest. My father's father and his sons cut down the trees, the cedar, fir, and hemlock, burned the stumps, chopped up firewood for my grandmother's stove, kitchen stove and the heater in the living room. They made boards and shingles and shakes. They built barns and granaries and chicken coops and fences with the wood. And every time the soil in the field is turned, with the disc of the plow in readiness for planting, fresh sticks see the light of day. They are the roots from the trees that were cut down 40, 50, 60 years ago. My father fires up the John Deere and moves the wagon forward when we've properly picked over an area of a foot field. Mother picks sticks too, but midway through the afternoon she gets in the pickup, drives back to the house and brings us cold juice and baking powder biscuits with strawberry jam when we take a break. She drives just fine, as far as I can see, for someone without a driver's license. I lean on the wagon to eat and drink, and don't worry about my dusty fingers. Mum buys fruity syrup in a container with a pump on the top from Mrs. Price, the Watkins lady, who comes up the valley in her panel truck and gives us kids tiny packages of lifesavers. She shows us where she sleeps in the back of the truck with the stacks of Watkins products. To me, it sounds like an exotic way to live. <laughs> When I make a glass of juice for myself in the kitchen, I add several extra squirts and sometimes stir in that teaspoon of baking soda to make it fizz against my face when I drink it. I hope none of the kids my age will drive by with their parents and see me in this field. What if they wave and shout? I will die a thousand deaths here in the dusty heat. Sometimes a young man will roar past and blast his horn. At 13, I am not madly in love with anyone yet. Still, my sister is older. Perhaps they honk for her sake. Really, where I want to be is where I think all the people in the cars are headed, down the valley for a swim in one mile lane. <laughs> Perfection for me is a shallow dive from the float into the cool water, a few lazy strokes out to the rocks that hide just below the surface of the lake. Here I will perch and look back at the kids fooling around on the wharf and the parents picnicking on the shore as the water gently laps around my shivering shoulders. A <laughs> uh, last thing we're going to talk about is a little bit on work. So I think we'll just talk about pain. Um, it seems like, I don't know if kids today that live on the farm work all summer hay. But that's what we did. It felt like it was every day of the whole summer long. <laughs> um, 
I just think, can you imagine trying to run a farm with the help of oh, two girls that just didn't even care a bit about it? <laughs> Dad used to hire help when he, when he could or when he had to. I remember a man called Hank Thompson. He was a fellow extremely proud of how much he sweated. He lived in Mount Curry. He was, he's memorable to me. Janet doesn't remember him. Hank Thompson, you were the shortest man we'd ever seen. Tramped the hay mow at the old place. Sweated, you announced, worse than a horse. Swallowed salt tablets at the water trough. Laughed when things went wrong. Grinned with a grin of seven teeth. Rode in the back of the pickup home. Proclaimed the breeze was worth the dust. <laughs> Our reward for working all summer was that we could buy our own school clothes out of the Sears catalog. We could choose whatever we wanted. Mom never said, no, I don't think that's right, that won't do, that's not the right material, which I would do. <laughs> <laughs> but I always thought, I, I, I'm not unaware of how looking so closely at those beautiful girls in the Sears catalog has sort of worked my, my, uh, my own impression of myself. I still think today if I can get the right outfit, I'll look pretty darn good. <laughs> <laughs> Janet has a little story about sewing, do you, Janet? Oh, I do. Just tell the story. Okay, yeah. yeah, it was... Um, uh, I found some material upstairs where Mom kept all the material. Mom and Dad went off to a lapidary class or something. I started sewing after supper. Had to go to school the next day. I sewed. They came home. They said, I think you should go to bed maybe. And I said, oh, I'm just working. So I sewed and I sewed. I had a pattern. I had lots of material. So I oh, I'll put a ruffle. And I, 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 I made these certain buttons and, um, and buttonholes and wonderful blouse. And then the next morning, I had hardly any sleep, I got on the bus. <laughs> I got on the, wearing my new blouse. I was probably in grade eight. And I get on the bus, the door shuts, I'm walking down the aisle, and somebody says, is the circus in town? <laughs> <laughs> and I look down at my blouse, and it was red and white stripes. <laughs> to me. She's going to read a bit from the letter. I will read a final poem about Richie Valley. And then you're sprung. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this was October 1968. I was 15 in grade 11. And um, we were getting mechanized and Dad and Mitchell had bought a new harvest, potato harvester before they were just go along the road, dump them all out, and you pick three buckets into a sack, three buckets into a sack. But here, people <coughs> stood on the edge of this harvester, maybe two people on each side, I can't remember. Um, and it had it had problems, because it, it was probably not new, but it was new to, to Mitchell's and to our family. So what happened is, Mom got her arm stuck in the machine and pulled in up to her neck in, in the machine. And um, Linda was in Vancouver at um, college, so I wrote her a letter the next day. It didn't call me. Um, I say, um, Mums in Squamish Hospital, you know the new potato digger that Mitchell's and, and us share. Well, she got her arm caught in moving the table or chain or whatever it's called. Dad said she got pulled up right to her neck. It's hard to explain because I'm not sure how it happened. She was working at the end of the digger pulling the vines out. This happened yesterday just before noon I gather. Dad had to take the whole machine apart to get her out. Dad phoned every nurse he could think of. He couldn't reach him so he phoned the police. Brickenden I guess told Dad to phone the doctor in Squamish and do what he said. 
And that's what Dad did. Mom went out on the stretcher in the taxi. Wow. And I came home from school and wondered where Mom was. I saw a bowl with face cloth in their room. And then Molly came in, Clara's mom. And she said, how's your mother? I didn't have a clue. I didn't even know there was anything wrong. Molly offered to take the kids, but I decided I could manage, even if it meant missing out on quite a lot, like volleyball. <coughs> and, um, okay. Um, I dialed and Dad talked to the hospital last night. They said she was resting comfortably. Um, and I talk about, you wouldn't believe what it's like to come home from school at 4 o'clock and work steady until 7.30. <laughs> <laughs> And then there was an interruption in the letter because some kids came by to see me. I'm here, I'm grief-stricken and crying and writing this letter, and then Bob, and Doug, and Lennon, and Mark came to see me. And uh, the Mitchells had bought a $25 car from Mr. Henry. <laughs> and they drove down the dike and across the fields to get to our place. And we went for a bomb around the grain field. Wow. I couldn't stop laughing, even when we hit the dip in the field. I bet we went three feet up, car and all. <laughs> they came in for a few minutes and just left. You have to push the car to start it. You have to go back through the, through the dike. Anyway, I came back in and darn, I just burnt the bottom of the juicer to the hot plate. It was on one, and if you've ever stuck two metals together because of too much heat, you know what I mean. It was the last of the plums anyway. I've already burned two batches of cupcakes today because I was doing something else. I'm glad I washed my hair last night because I don't have any time to wash my hands tonight. And um, Dad, the, Dad left about 6.30 that night for Squamish. He thought he should go out and see Mom. That's really all he can do because he feels pretty bad. And I had written guilty and I crossed it out. <laughs> but the guilty was he told me he was watching them working from on the digger and he thought he should tell them not to reach that way because they might get hurt. And he glanced ahead and seeing that they were almost finished the road, he thought it could wait. As it was, the accident wouldn't have happened if he'd stopped and walked back to tell them to be more careful. And Selma picked a bunch of flowers for Mom from the garden and I wrote Mom a note. Thelma's flowers has stems on them about one inch long. <laughs> kind of hard to arrange. <laughs> I asked Molly, who's eight, how, how long she would have picked from this one. So I don't know. The brown Selma. Um, the kids are being quite good. That is, this is Bruce and Selma, who were eight and six, I guess. Um, that is a bit better than usual, which is still not all that good. <laughs> you should see the way Salma folds clothes. Flip, flop, plop, pat. There, it's done. That was the pants. The sheets stretched out across the living room floor. Stomp, stomp. Anyway, it's better than having the clothes all over the utility room floor. After I stopped crying, which I, I took a couple of aspens and the phone rang. I thought, oh God. I'll have to say what I've already said 60 million times before. Instead, it was Mrs. Kenyon who wanted to know if the Ferguson's phone was out. <laughs> and then I tell them to give me a better phone when you get this letter. Thanks. I talked about, in, in number one, about uh, driving to town to my job. I, I worked at the cafe and I worked in the grocery store. The middle one's about us when we were young kids. And then the last is explanatory. Coast Mountain Valley. I leave the yard in the August dawn. Gun the knocking rambler up the driveway. Only the horses notice, nodding their noses over the twisted planks of the pasture fence. Potato fields stretch from the road to the mountains. A dark, ripe green you can almost taste. In a month, the tops will be killed lie burnt and lifeless, ready for digging. Two. Seven miles from farm to town, we rode in the back, would close our eyes, chant the route, yell it into the wind, voices of girls who were not afraid. Uncle Robbie's Rhine Creek, first rock slide, curved by the slough, Miller Creek, 
Uncle Morgan's Double Churn, Lundgren's, Taylor's Corner, Second Rock Slide, Stop Sign in Front of the Bank, Town. By 68, I'm ready to go. Work the early shift at the hotel, buy myself Judge Decker's car after he dies. And one October day, the cottonwoods alight, drive south on 99, past the fields, the rivers, the blackbirds in the green gauge. I don't know then, but the place will follow me, old dog who won't turn back. Thank you very much.